Hey guys, welcome to part three of the Tantalizing Titbit Cruising Series. Don't know why I just did that. <laughs> Playing some drums, I think. Part three, we'll be finishing up the Mediterranean with our final tips and tricks. And then we're going to be going on to leaving the Mediterranean to the Atlantic Crossing in part four. So I really hope you enjoy this episode. Remember to subscribe, give us a like. Comment below if you've got any questions, queries, or cool information that might be able to help someone else out there. Um, so yeah, let's jump in. The Med is a really great spot for food and for provisioning. The food's generally pretty cheap and it is always super accessible. There is always a supermarket, mini marts, really close to marinas. So there is no shortage of food, especially fresh fruit and veg which actually starts to become scarce once you start leaving the med. What can we recommend? Stock up now on things that aren't gonna perish and, and that are long-term foods. Think about like cooking oils and tin foods and things that are gonna be able to keep in your boat for like the next year. Because we found once we hit the Caribbean, things like coconut oil, super expensive. We still have some canned food that we bought in the med and we're talking about like eight months later because we just stocked up on it when we could. And our friends on Gia, they're still getting through cast wine that they bought for like 80 cents a litre uh, in Spain. And they're still pulling that out of their bilges now. Equivalent of that now in the South Pacific is like 10 bucks. So they're doing well for the cast wine. We also found it really cool to like search out the local fruit and veg markets. It was a really nice way to kind of immerse yourself in the local cuisines and whatnot without going to the restaurants because you could go and like pick up the fresh fruit, veggies, like fish, meat, whatever you want, and then cook it up on the boat. Um, we found that a really nice way to just experience the culture a little more and find some cool stuff along the way. It was also generally cheaper than the supermarkets. So yeah, think big picture. If there are some things that you know that you use a lot of, stock up now because it'll pay dividends further down the track. With all that cooking, you're going to be using a bunch of gas. Uh, gas in the Mediterranean, I'm sure everyone's, 90% of people must be using the small swap and go gas, gas tanks. Most marinas also refill gas tanks, but the swap and goes were so easy. It's definitely been a challenge since leaving the Med to get gas refilled, especially here in the South Pacific. Like to get gas refilled here, you need a bunch of adapters. They do it by gravity filling. There's no swap and goes. There's different fittings and whatnot. So the med is super easy. Most chandleries, most marinas, even some supermarkets are just swapping gas bottles. But be careful. We definitely got ripped off quite a few times with picking up half-filled gas bottles. Grease was the worst because we have uh, the three, kilos, three kilo bottles. We now carry three of them. And each of those will be lasting us about four weeks, assuming they're full. So between that, we can normally get like, you know, 10 to 12 weeks on those bottles. It was easy when you could swap and go. Like we must have swapped maybe three times, four times in the med. Um, but now we find ourselves kind of refilling them in bulk. We'll always, when we're down to our last tank, we'll refill two. And then, yeah, go on from there. Also then provisioning for the boat in terms of fuel. You don't need to take too many jerry cans with you because there's quite a few, there's quite a lot of fuel pumps all around the Meb. The price varied a lot. I mean, we paid everything from like 80 cents a litre in Gibraltar to like two, two euros a litre in Sardinia. That was the worst we paid. But I do think fuel was more expensive than the Caribbean. It's definitely been more expensive than the South Pacific, actually. But there's also a few hotspots around where fuel is cheap. And generally, it's all about a tax. So have a little research as to where are going to be the best spots to fill up. Take a few jerry cans with you, but I don't think you need to go crazy with storing fuel in jerry cans on the boat. We only ever carried about 40 litres in jerry cans when we are in the med. We now carry 100 now that we're doing sort of cruising to more remote places. Finally, water. Water is pretty accessible there in the Med. Obviously, all the marinas have got it. Uh, 
a really nice little hack that we found worked for us was we often call up the marinas on the radio and we'd try to do it around midday and we'd ask them just to come in and fill up with water. So we'd come in for like an hour or two into the marina during the day. We'd just fill up with water. Often they charge you maybe like five euros or something like that. You could wash down the boat, have a shower, fill it up with water, and then get out of there and go anchor and it cost you five euros. Water was probably our biggest reason for going to marinas. Otherwise, we just enjoyed anchoring out. So use that little hack, give them a call up on the radio, say, hey, we just want to come in, grab some water, how much will it be? It might be five euros, 10 euros, something like that. Also, if you've got some people, like some crew or something, send them out to the shops for an hour or two, come back, do the shopping, everyone jump on board, you're out of there in like two hours. I would say also, just be careful of some of the water. Either test it before you drink it, make sure it's potable. Again, we picked up dodgy water in Greece, and we even picked up a little bit of dodgy water in Sardinia. Um, we now have a water filter. Uh, it's called a, like a Nature Pure. It's a Nature Pure QC water filter, similar to like the Seagull system. Um, really great at filtering the water. It does not filter out salt, so just keep that in mind, but it filters out all the bad stuff. Uh, so that really helped just picking up, you know, varying qualities of water, having the water filter was a lifesaver. On Avalon, we started when we bought the boat, we had like 280 liters. We then threw in another 200 liters of water tanks into the boat. So we now carry about 500 liters of water and we could find that easily lasts us like four or five weeks. Um, and we're not trying too hard on water rations there. So that's it for tips in terms of provisioning. Next one is weather. I gotta say in general, the weather in the Med was really quite pleasant. You don't get sea breezes, so the wind is somewhat unpredictable. As I said before, it's either like four knots or 40 knots. We definitely had some periods of like some really unstable weather around Sardinia and whatnot, which, you know, we had some really crazy, crazy fronts coming in. Assuming you're on Wi-Fi, the apps are working really well. Windy, Predict Wind, all of that were really great resources. Check out the marinas. They'll always have some kind of weather um, at reception, like a weather report. Um, so just keep a little eye out for anything that might be popping up. But in general, it was really pleasant sailing. As we got towards the end of the season, you really started to see a lot of red on those maps. A lot of systems starting to pop up as winter was starting to come in. So our weather windows started to become smaller and smaller and, and further apart as we got towards the end of the season. So keep that in mind that you want to be starting to really wrap up your sailing, I would say, in October. Like September, October, because yeah, we started to really experience bad weather towards that part of the season. In retrospect, we probably actually did a lot more motoring than we realized in the med, simply because the wind would just die for days. And so when you're doing long crossings, we actually ended up motoring quite a bit for those crossings. And we really didn't have time to be just sitting out there for days at sea. We are on a little bit of a tight schedule. We had to get places. We're often meeting people. So, you know, that two, three day crossing, we sort of needed to be averaging that four or five knots to make it happen. And we definitely found that the wind would die more often than not. So just think about that when you're planning these crossings, maybe take that little bit of extra fuel um, and try and pick a really good weather window out of there. Also research where you're ending, ending up. I mean, there are definitely some prevailing winds that will just come through the med and they'll sort of just come in like three to four day cycles. A good example is like coming out of Sardinia to cross over to Spain, uh, the prevailing wind is called the mistral. So often every few days, that mistral would come in at like 30 to 40 knots um, and be howling for like three days and then it would back off and you'd be able to then like choose your weather window. So that started to really pick up in September and our weather windows out of Sardinia became few and far between. You know, there's other ones down in Greece and Croatia. They've all kind of got their own name for that system. 
but definitely do a little bit of research to where you end up in that part of the season because you'll want to get your head around where those wins are coming from and how often they're coming out there. So a few really helpful resources that we found while cruising the med. A lot of these are online things. So Noon Sight, absolute gold mine. As I said before, Navali was a really great app for anchoring. We also found the Facebook group Med Sailors and whatnot really, really helpful. Uh, you could post up questions about places and whatnot, and there was such a great community of people out there that were happy to answer questions, give you information, point you in the right direction, even come and help you themselves. So jump on and join those Facebook groups. And finally, we listened to a lot of podcasts. The podcasts were really great. The one we listened to a lot is Franz at Med Sailors. His podcast is Sailing the Mediterranean. Definitely check that out. A really good wealth of knowledge, good ports to go to, checking in, checking out, how to cruise, all of that. He's been doing it for like 25 years, so really good information. And then finally, the pilot guides. Obviously, the pilot guides are also a really great wealth of knowledge, um, but I did find a lot of information online, so I didn't always need the books. Um, and then, yeah, we used our Navionics charts as well. Also, some good equipment for the med. As I said before, make sure you got some stern 2 equipment so you can tie the back of the boat up and do the whole med mooring stern 2 anchoring. Uh, we wish we had a higher power dinghy. That's not so med specific, but we did actually find like ourselves anchoring around from the major cities and whatnot. And just a higher powered, te high powered tender would have been great just to whip around into the cities. Probably would have allowed us to anchor a lot more. As I said, additional water storage and the water filter came in, came in real handy and carrying a few extra gas bottles just meant you didn't have to dip into those marinas too often. In terms of renewables, solar panels are absolutely gold. The Mediterranean summer just produces so much sun. It is generally always sunny. Um, and I think you'd get a lot more bang for your buck out of solar rather than wind. Uh, we'll talk about when the wind really comes into its own when you're in the trades. But yeah, the med was really not that windy, but heaps of sun. So think about that. So guys, I really hope you enjoyed part three of the tantalizing tidbit cruising series. And then we're going to be going on to leaving the Mediterranean to the Atlantic crossing in part four. Make sure you subscribe to the channel. Make sure you hit like if you enjoyed that and comment below if you've got any questions or any additional additional information that could be really helpful to our fellow, sa fellow sailors out there um, and to myself that I might be able to include into the next one. Um, and yeah, I really hope you enjoy these Finding Avalon tantalizing tidbits. Also guys, don't forget, if you want to become a patron, jump on board, link below. We try to pump out all kinds of informational videos like this for patron only. Um, there's a bunch of tiers, bunch of different access, bunch of extra content out there. So yeah. If you're interested in this kind of stuff and you want to support the journey, get on that. And if you noticed, I've got some super sweet tees on. Jump onto the link below to our merch site. And yeah, if you want to buy some Finding Avalon gear, get on board. Looking sexy! See you guys.